Okay, so this is um, another video for Unit 5. Here we are going to be discussing uh, properties of real gases and basically how those um, differ from the ideal gases that we use to discuss the gas laws and the kinetic molecular theory. So here we're just going to look at how real gases differ from ideal gases. Um, we'll also look a little bit at explaining the properties or the conditions when that happens the most. So real gases, we're first going to define the properties of real gases. We're going to look at what makes them real, specifically the intermolecular forces. And then we're going to look at how we correct for that mathematically. And then I'm just going to discuss a couple of examples of real gases um, before we end. Now, when we did the kinetic molecular theory in this unit, we assume that gases behave that way for all of the gas laws. There's no interactions, there's elastic collisions, um, and so on. It turns out that is only true at high temperature and low pressure. If you have high temperature, gas particles are moving around so fast, they don't have a chance to stop after a collision and interact with something. They keep going really, really far. Same thing, low pressure. You have a very low pressure, you only have a few particles. The likelihood of these particles ever colliding is minimal. And so they don't have any interactions or uh, non-elastic collisions because they're so far apart, they're probably not going to bump into each other anyway. Now, on the other hand, um, if you raise that pressure or lower temperature, here you've got a lot of neighbors. Um, think about the halls like of a high school between classes. It's really hard not to bump into somebody. Um, you have to kind of work around them. And so there you have some interactions that are going to happen. Same thing like if you lower temperature. You lower temperature, you're going to lower the speed that the gas particles are traveling. And so they can again stop and say hi, I guess. Um, so at these conditions, intermolecular forces are going to be a problem. Um, and so real gases are going to have those intermolecular forces and it's going to reduce the pressure that we observe, okay? Now, technically, gases that don't want to interact, noble gases or nonpolar molecules, which I know we don't talk about until later this unit, but just keep that in mind, noble gases and particles that don't want to react will have very low intermolecular uh, forces. On the other hand, ionic compounds, polar compounds, remember water is polar, um, things that like to interact and that like to um, react are going to have much higher uh, forces present. Now your reading includes the forces that are present, London dispersion forces, um, this is basically a uh, force from a temporary dipole. Um, everybody has this. It's just that they tend to be very small for small molecules, very big for, for bigger ones. There's dipole-dipole interactions that come from a permanent dipole. Um, and then there's hydrogen bonding from molecules that have like OH, um, NH, uh, and FH bonds. Um, and then there's ionic interactions that can happen where you have a positive ion and a negative ion that attract each other and they slow each other down. Now technically guys, we don't really get into the intermolecular forces um, in this unit too much. Um, the only reason I'm even giving that brief discussion is because it is in your reading and it's kind of nice to know what interactions are happening, not just, oh, they interact. And so I'm trying to give you a brief introduction here. We come back in, um, it's unit 11 or 12, I think it is, and we do um, interactions at a much 
more detailed uh, level, okay? Now, what this means, goodness gracious, there we go. Um, our pressure that we observe is going to be lower than what it should be because these interactions are going to slow down the particles before they hit the walls, okay? In addition, real gases do take up volume. Those particles do take up space inside this flask, and so you can't just discount that. Now, the bigger the molar mass, the more volume they take up. Um, this means that our observed volume is going to be too low, because um, we're not taking the volume of the container minus the volume that the molecules occupy. Now, if you think back to the ideal gas law, PV over NRT is equal to 1. Um, here, if these were completely ideal, if, if real gases behave the, the right way, and I know it's really hard to see this, but um, there we go. Higher pressure or um, lower temperature, so here's your lower temperatures, here's your higher pressures, give you a um, very, well, goodness, give you a deviation from that value of 1. We'll leave it there. Now, we can correct for those things by talking about the Van der Waals equation. Now again, don't freak out. This is not on your exam. Um, due to time constraints, I'm not going to quiz you mathematically on this because this value and this value have to be looked up from a table. And I can't ask you to do that for two things um, within the allotted time per question. Um, however, what I want you to take away from this is, in order to correct, we will need to add in some constant times the moles over the volume that it allows for us to account for the inter intermolecular forces that are happening with collisions. And so this will raise the P from the pressure that's observed to the ideal pressure. So this is our corrected or our ideal pressure. Same thing down here. We will have the volume of the container minus the volume that the particles occupy to get the corrected volume. And then NR and T are left alone because they aren't affected by the real properties of gases. Now, one of the best places to observe um, gases at work is through air pollution. Um, now, your reading has a lot more detail than what I'm going to go to here, but I'm going to give some more explanation than what your reading does. So there's two sources of pollution. Um, there's primary sources, and then once those primary sources leak in pollution, you get reactions and derivatives happen happening to give you secondary sources of pollution. So with that in mind, um, oops, this should be a capital O. We have two areas in our everyday life that really contribute to air pollution. The first is through combustion engines. Combustion engines are going to burn um, organic compounds in the presence of nitrogen at high temperatures. So you end up getting something like NO2, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide that are all produced. Carbon monoxide can be oxidized into carbon dioxide, and this can be um, decomposed into nitrogen monoxide and oxygen, which is a free radical. Okay. Now, carbon dioxide in itself isn't that harmful but at large quantities, it is a greenhouse gas and has issues with that. Carbon monoxide, on the other hand, is incredibly toxic. Um, 
which is why a lot of homes, especially if you use natural gas, will have a carbon monoxide detector to try and prevent um, deaths and so on from that. Um, the other main area from for us where we pr produce pollution is through the burning of coal for electricity. Um, now, technically, you tend to get off um, SO2, which can be oxidized with oxygen to produce SO3. And then in the presence of water, these two things combine to get H2SO4. Sulfuric acid, if you think back to unit four, is a strong acid. It's also the primary source of acid rain. Um, so any problems we have with um, metal structures and things like that, um, decomposing statues and so on, bridges um, decomposing, has to do primarily with um, acid rain a little bit. Now, the way that they're trying to reduce um, this output from coal is by using what's called scrubbers. And so the way they do that is they take uh, where they're burning the coal and they put in something like calcium oxide, which will combine with SO2, um, which is a byproduct of burning coal, to make calcium sulfite. Now in Unit 4, I didn't give you sulfites on that solubility table because they're mostly insoluble. Um, and so what they do with this uh, calcium sulfite is they can um, reduce it, I think reduce, change it, modify it over to gypsum and use it as fertilizer. They can use it in drywall or in paper. Um, there's a ton of sources where this is used. And so they've been able to reduce a lot of the um, emissions from burning coal through use, the use of a scrubber. Um, it's just that not all countries do that. There's also um, volatile organic compounds in the air, things like uh, carbon monoxide, methane, um, sources that uh, el elsewhere. There's also particulates and free radicals. Now, once you have um, compounds in the air, you get the secondary sources like smog. Um, and again, that's particulates. It's also things like this, um, the carbon dioxide is a secondary because it, carbon monoxide oxidizes. Um, nitrogen monoxide would be secondary, um, acid rain, and so on. Now, smog um, is actually tied to a bunch of health issues. So like if you know, for example, uh, let me start over. So the number of cases of asthma and other respiratory diseases has increased significantly since the 1970s um, when things have been used more, more industry and so on. Um, I don't know the number of new cases a year. I used to and I've forgotten it. Um, but I do know that there's something like, in Ontario, there's something like 9,000 deaths a year just from exposure to smog. Um, I think it was, it was either London or another European country did a study not too long ago where high exposure to smog um, is also tied to birth defects. And um, it's definitely tied to respiratory diseases and things like that as well. The There's a couple places um, in America that are doing a long-term study related to exposure to smog and cancer. But I haven't gone to the peer-reviewed journals for that yet. Now, but for example, if you know... Mm -hmm -hmm, In the morning, people get up, they start their cars, they start getting ready for work. This is especially true in big cities. And so you have low levels of something like nitrogen dioxide at first, and then that builds. Well, then the nitrogen dioxide is going to be converted 
to nitrogen monoxide. You're also going to get high levels of carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. You might have higher levels during the middle of the day, probably not as accurate, of um, SO2 and other things. And so what will happen is on a specifically, usually it's at summer, um, if they know the temperature is going to be high enough that it's going to elevate these levels, it's going to allow the reactions to happen faster, they will put out a health advisory from something like, I don't know, 10 to 4, depending on where you live. And they'll tell you young people and elderly should not go out unless they absolutely have to due to the um, air quality. And so um, this is one of the ways that we're kind of countering that. So that's what I wanted to say about smog. As far as ozone is concerned, we generally think of ozone as a good thing. And it is when it's in the atmosphere, way up here, not down here. Um, when it is at the ground level, we breathe in ozone and our body thinks that it is oxygen, but it actually can't use it the same way. And so what happens with ozone is it's um, almost the same effect as like carbon monoxide. It's, it, it does not allow you to get the oxygen you need where you need it. On the other hand, we have too much ozone on the ground level. We have too little up above us now. Um, and that's because of free radicals. Remember when we were talking about combustion engines, we had this oxygen come off the nitrogen dioxide. This free radical will come into an ozone and make oxygen. Um, Cl negative from uh, the CFCs that used to be used in air conditioning units can come up and react with ozone to produce oxygen and um, CO, CLO. Um, that CLO can continually react with ozone to make more oxygen and reproduce this chlorine. So the chlorine is recycled and can actually continue to react with ozone, destroying it for up to two years. So it's um, a little bit of a problem. So we have to figure out a way to reduce free radicals in the atmosphere because that's not good, OK? Now, I do have some review questions for you. Um, these are not meant to replace your homework questions or your studying. Um, and actually, I don't know if I'm going to be able to open this or not, but we'll try. But it should have um, problems. We do these together in class, um, but the answers are at the end. I can't open it right now. So you do need to be in slideshow mode to open that.